Councilmember Elizabeth Brown, would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, Council is joined by Pastor Amy Aspey, Senior Pastor at Short North Church, to pray over this first convening of the year. Pastor, welcome to Council. Welcome back to Council. Let, let us pray. God of us all, and not just some, may our gathering this, e this evening and each evening be a source of blessing for not just some people in our community, but for the whole community. May we seek to constantly do the hard work of understanding one another and the needs of those we serve. May we be quicker to listen than we are to speak and grant us the compassion and patience to hear what is spoken beyond words in silence, in suffering, in tears, and in laughter. Giver of wisdom, grant us discerning minds for the decisions before us this evening and the, in the year ahead. Instead of problems, expand our minds to see possibilities and never to lose sight of the people who will be impacted. Guide us in discovering solutions that do not compound suffering, especially of the most vulnerable. As we approach Martin Luther King Day, May Dr. King's prophetic dream embolden our work. May we too have the audacity to both believe and tirelessly work for a world where people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture of their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. Because injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Guide us in the ways of justice and remind us at the end of the day, there isn't an us in them. There is us. Thank you for the opportunity to serve and please bless the families of those who serve as those closest are often impacted in countless ways. May our community be a more just, loving, and kind place because of our leadership. In the name of all that is holy, amen. Amen. Clark, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Hardin. This week's communication received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the journal? Not at this time. The first item of business for council this evening is the appointment of a new council member for city council to fill the vacated seat of former council member Jiza Page. Will the clerk now read Ms. Page's letter of resignation into the record? Dated December 12, 2018. Dear President Hardin, please accept this letter as formal notification of my resignation from Columbus City Council, effective midnight, January 2, 2019. I am forever grateful for the opportunity to serve the residents of Columbus with you and our colleagues. Thank you for your leadership, and I thank our colleagues for their dedication to this city. I am looking forward to my next journey in public service, and I wish you all continued Success very respectfully, Jiza Page, Columbus City Council member. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, before I call for nom nomination, a nomination for the vacancy uh, by former Council Member Page, I just want to again echo my remarks from the public hearing uh, a few days ago um, that we are blessed as a city to have the caliber of folks step up uh, to serve in this fashion. Um, the 56 people that put their names forward originally were um, extremely impressive. The 15 folks that the community really got a chance to hear from kicked the tires a bit in the first of, of its kind, the first time ever public process um, for filling a vacancy. Um, 
I think folks, when it left um, those conversations, understanding how uh, credible and ready to go any of those 15 folks that stepped forward uh, were. Um, and so for all of you um, that I, I say thank you. Uh, everyone who applied shared their vision with us, a set of ideas that they believe can improve the quality of life in Columbus. And this council values partnerships. Ideas don't arise in silos, but are built through collaboration and exchange. And so as we move forward, one, we have another appointment that we'll make on February 25th. Um, but regardless if you were one of these two uh, chosen to uh, join our team this year, um, consider us partners because we certainly consider you a partner. Before I ask for nominations, are there any comments from members of this council? Seeing none, may I get a nomination uh, for, uh, I would like to open the floor to fill the vacancy as a member of Columbus City Council. Are there any nominations? President Hardin, I nominate Ms. Shayla Favor to replace Judge Jiza Page. Second. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Mr. Stanziano? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes. President Hardin? Yes. Congratulations, Councilmember Favor. <laughs> Can I get a motion for a five minute recess? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hart. We will reconvene in five minutes. May I have a motion to reconvene regular meeting number one? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hart. Are there any resolutions by members of council? Start with Council Member Elizabeth Brown. Yes, I do have a resolution tonight. Um, if the guests could come up, please, um, from public education partners, Anita Beck, Maureen Reedy, Jean Melvin, Russ Harris, and also representatives from the Columbus Education Association, President John Coneglio and Vice President Phil Hayes. Tonight we have uh, Resolution 0005-2019 to recognize January 20th through January 26, 2019 as Public Education Week in Columbus, Ohio. Um, you, never, you can go to the podium if you'd like, and whoever plans to speak, just be on the ready. Universal access to a high quality public education is one of the most effective ways we can ensure equitable access to opportunity for every resident. That is why I am pleased to present this resolution recognizing Public Education Week in Columbus. From basic skills such as reading, writing, and math, to sparking curiosity in a lifelong pursuit of knowledge and innovation, to helping prepare students for successful careers and creating a workforce that is prepared for the future, to encouraging students to be active and informed citizens capable of guiding our country through voting and civic engagement. Public education truly is a foundational building block of our society. Columbus City Schools is the largest district in the state of Ohio. We serve more than 50,000 students each year through public education right here in our city. Clearly, the more we do to promote and support the success of Columbus City Schools, both inside and outside the classroom, the more we help our community thrive. It takes the hard work and dedication of teachers, administrators, students, parents, and elected officials working together to help ensure our public education system is the best it can be. Thank you to the teachers, former teachers, and public education advocates for being here tonight to help highlight the importance of public education in Columbus. Uh, before I pass the microphone over to you, are there any comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for adoption. Second. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. Microphone is yours. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, thank you, Columbus City Council, for proclaiming January 20th through 26th as Public Education Week. Issuing this proclamation gives us the opportunity to shine a positive spotlight on the K-12 public education available for children and families in Ohio. My name is Jean Melvin. I'm a board member of an organization called Public Education Partners. 
Our acronym is PEP. We're a statewide nonprofit that was created to connect and unite advocates that support public school districts and children and their families. PEP is a nonpartisan group that was formed to support publicly accountable Ohio schools for all students to advocate for equitably funded public schools that offer a full curriculum to all children and to help connect public education advocacy groups across the state. I'm a veteran educator with 27 years of experience as an elementary classroom teacher in a Central Ohio school district, as well as 12 more years as a gifted intervention specialist. I'm a proud graduate of Mount Vernon City Schools, and my three daughters are public school alumni as well. My granddaughter is a local school district kindergartner, and her brother attends a preschool program offered by that same school district. So obviously, my family and I regard public education very highly. Through my career as a public school teacher, I witnessed firsthand the important role that public education plays in preparing students to be successful adults. Public schools are welcoming places in local communities where people from all walks of life can send their children to learn together. Schools that teach children not only how to read and write, but also how to work and play together. Public schools are what we need to help heal the deep divisions in our state and in our nation. Public school districts need to be equitably funded so they have the necessary resources to offer a top-notch curriculum to every student. Public education is a public good, and we must strive to protect and preserve what the delegates to the 1850 Ohio Constitutional Convention intended, a high-quality education for all children. We believe that our political leaders need to elevate the education, health, and well-being of our children to become primary concerns in local and state government. And you have, by passing this resolution, you have taken an important step in that direction. So thanks again. We encourage all elected leaders to support legislation that would declare moratoriums on new charter schools and school voucher programs, which currently take funding and other valuable resources away from our public school districts. We must all work together to repeal the state takeovers of schools imposed in House Bill 70, which are undemocratic, unaccountable, and unacceptable. Our state should instead provide resources to revitalize schools as wraparound community learning centers that bring health, dental, and mental health clinics, after school programs, and parent support programs into the neighborhood schools. Ohio must guarantee a comparable opportunity to learn for every child, which includes a quality early childhood education, qualified teachers, a rich curriculum that will prepare students for college, work, and community, and equitable instructional resources. Our kids are worth it. Thanks again, Columbus City Council, for proclaiming next week as Public Education Week. And next week, Public Education Partners, or PEP, will host a State House event on Thursday, January 24th, appropriately named Celebrate Public Education. And you are all invited. Maureen Reedy will now share details of that event. Thank you. Thank you, Council and President Hardin and Council Member Brown for this honor. Um, this will be quick. We, uh, last year, you issued this proclamation uh, for declaring uh, Public Ed Education Week for the first time in Ohio, and we decided why not celebrate public education right at the State House? And so we did. And next week is our second annual Celebrate Public Education event at the State House Atrium on the 24th over the lunch hour. Um, I am a proud graduate of Columbus City Schools. In fact, Eastmore High School, uh, who's being honored tonight with the state, uh, the city championship award and the final four in the state, was my high school. And uh, our football team was pretty good back then with the Griffin brothers as well. Um, I also am now, after 36 years as a public school teacher, I am substituting in Columbus City Schools. Uh, we are welcoming uh, next week Fort Hayes and Indianola, Columbus City Schools that are public school choice for parents that integrate the arts. There'll be a poetry slam. There'll be an integrated arts celebration with the Harlem Renaissance with art, history, dance, and poetry. 
there'll be the Columbus Hearing Impaired Program at Huey Elementary where children with challenges um, who are hearing impaired receive the resources and the supports they need to be integrated into regular ed classrooms where they can shine. We will also have uh, East Cleveland here with their marching band. We will have a, a Boardman High School in North, near Youngstown and Hoover from North Canton with Stand Up for Public Education video uh, that they won awards with the Ohio School Boards Association. We will also have Upper Arlington Schools, a public school choice, Wycliffe, um, which build a partnership between the art teacher and the Alzheimer's Foundation with a one-month community-wide project integrating fifth grade classroom with Alzheimer patients. We will also have um, Cincinnati Community Learning Centers. To wrap it up, we talk about wraparound to support our kids with challenges today and our families. Wraparound services in Columbus or Cincinnati uh, uh, public schools are in each building. There are over 740 partnerships with local businesses, such as an organization such as the United Way um, and the Y, to support children with needs. They have medical clinics, vision clinics, they have social workers, they have um, teams with community resource. Um, coordinators at each building and they will be talking about their program so that we can look at spreading this statewide instead of disrupting and di dismantling school districts that have challenges we want to see those resources return to the public schools strengthen them um, grow their resources with partnerships with the community and we thank you again for your support and invite you all to come and join us in celebrating public education next week on Thursday at the Ohio State House. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I believe President Coniglia. Council President Hardin, Council Member Brown, and all the city council and all of City Council, on behalf of the more than four uh, more than four thousand dedicated professionals of the Columbus Education Association, I'd like to say thank you for today's resolution. Public education is the cornerstone of American democracy. Our country needs informed and active citizens. Through public education, our children learn about their rights, freedoms, and to be critical thinkers, and how to deliberate to reach a consensus. Public, public education is the vehicle by which Columbus children are exposed to different career paths and learn the work skills to be career ready after graduation. Public education encourages students to seek further education at the collegiate level. Public education is the instrument by which our children learn about diversity and the benefits of living in a multicultural society. In turn, this allows them to become well-adjusted, empathetic citizens. Furthermore, public education attracts highly qualified and dedicated professionals that give their best to the students every single day. Finally, public education welcomes all students regardless of their race, color, creed, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status. Once again, I would like to thank City Council for this resolution and its ongoing commitment to public education. Thank you so much. Councilmember Mitch Brown. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Ramey. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. I have a couple of announcements this evening. Uh, my office will be hosting community hours on uh, Thursday, January 17th from 9 to 10.30 a.m. at Tim Hortons at 1451 West Broad Street. And then again on Tuesday, January 22nd from 5 to 6.30 at the new MLK Branch Library at 1467 East Long Street. That will be in meeting room one. That's all I have for this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. President Pro Tem. Thank you, President Harden. Well, Councilman Rumi, I thought you were going to compliment our Snow Warriors. Did a great job this weekend. I know we received some emails, and I know you were tracking them all through Saturday morning. Uh, so compliments to the department, uh, the Snow Warriors, and for your leadership of the committee. I do have two announcements. Uh, the first is would like to invite everyone to join uh, Mayor Andrew Genther in council on Monday, January 21st, as the city will be celebrating the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King at our annual march. The event will take place at East High School at 1500. East Broad Street. Doors for the event open at 4 p.m. March steps off promptly, 
promptly at 445 with the celebration to follow at 5 p.m. This year, the city's special guests will be the Honorable Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and I hope you all uh, think and consider of joining and marching with us. Councilmember Remy is also committed to making sure the slush is on the non-marching side of the street. Last year, we had some wonderful weather, uh, and in watching the forecast, we're not sure if we're gonna see that. I do wanna thank the Department of Neighborhoods uh, for their leadership and work in putting this wonderful event together. I know it's not an easy job, and not knowing what the turnout's always going to be, uh, but again, with Councilmember Remy's commitment to a slush-free path, uh, we're looking forward to a great march. For more information, residents can visit the columbus.gov slash neighborhood slash events page. Second, and if you are really excited and motivated from January 21st, March, I uh, invite uh, residents to uh, join me uh, and a number of other individuals as we host our second Senior Housing Stabilization Roundtable to provide an update from the last roundtable in October and to gather more feedback from residents and neighbors. In partnership with Age Friendly Columbus and the Franklin County Office on Aging, this event will be held on Wednesday, January 23rd at 11 a.m. at the Milo Grogan Recreation Center. The goal of the panel will again be to touch on the housing market and rising property taxes affecting residents' ability to age in place throughout our city and what we as a city can do. I hope you'll join me and panelists from the Central, Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging, Franklin County Office on Aging, the Senior Services Roundtable, the Columbus Urban League, and AARP. If you can't make it, not to worry, the event will be available to watch with the help of CTV on the city's YouTube page. And that's all I have this evening, Council President Harden. Thank you, President Pro Tum. Council Member Tyson. Thank you, President Harden. I have one resolution today, and I am going to ask for um, Coach Miranda from the from East from Eastmore Academy, Principal Brian Morton, and the City Champion football team of Eastmore Academy to come towards the podium, please. This is such an appropriate resolution just after hearing from about the first resolution and about public schools. So um, this resolution is to honor and to celebrate the Eastmore Academy High School boys football team on continuing the Eastmore tradition of excellence by winning the 2018 Columbus City Schools Boys Football Championship. Whereas the City of Columbus and the members of City Columbus City Council are proud to honor and celebrate the youth of this community as they represent the life and future of this community. Whereas Eastmore Academy High School, founded in 1954 as Eastmore High School, has a tradition of excellence which dates back more than 50 years. The Eastmore Academy Hall of Fame includes two-time Heisman Trophy, win Trophy winner Archie Griffin, um, I'm Columbus City Councilman Priscilla Tyson, proud Eastmore grad, and I'm in the Hall of Fame at Eastmore. All right, former State Senator Charlita Tavares, Attorney Scott Schiff, um, Scott Reeves, Franklin County Treasurer Cheryl Brooks Sullivan, Jean Caslin, Rich Leck, Michael Feinstein, Ted Briggs, Robert Selsley, and many others. In 2018, the boys track and field team won the Columbus City Schools, High Schools Track and Field Championship and was recognized by Columbus City Council for doing so for the eighth consecutive season. The school has consistently been recognized for its participation in the annual Columbus Rotary Service Above Self School Fair, including being named the overall most exemplary project in 2011, whereas Eastmore Academy High School, known as Warriors, was redesigned in 2000 as an alternative school with an academic focus that includes traditional, traditional high school aspirations. It is more than 743 students who are required to complete a rigorous academic cur curriculum while working and gaining hands-on intern internship experience within the community. Each Thursday, an Eastmore Academy student can be found working in doctors and dentist offices with Moody Nolan Architectural Firm at Grand Hospital, Coside, the Boys and Girls Club of Columbus, Columbus Metropolitan Libraries, with the Ohio Sickle Cell and Health Association, the Driving Park Animal Hospital, Soul Classics, Barrett's Orthodontics at The Ohio State University, at the Jewish Community Center of Greater Columbus, and at Columbus City Schools and more. 
Whereas Eastmore Academy is proud of its scholastic excellence, last year Eastmore Academy graduates were awarded more than $6 million in scholarships from colleges and universities across the United States. For the fourth consecutive year, Eastmore Academy graduates have received more than $4 million in scholarships. The school has a 96.2 graduation rate and is among the top three academic high schools in the Columbus City School District. Whereas Eastmore Academy High School has committed teaching staff that believes in academics and opportunities to help students learn in ways that are meaningful to them. This year, the Eastmore Academy High School boys football team, under the leadership of head coach Joe Miranda, who was named as a coach of the year by the Columbus Dispatch with the support of parents, teachers, administrators, friends, and other coaches, and a village of other successfully successfully guided the team of 2018 Columbus City Schools Boys High School Football Championship, the team that made it to it to the Division Three state semifinals and finished seventh in the state in the associated poll in the Division Three football football, three football. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of City Columbus, this council is hereby recognized Eastmore Academy High School Boys Football Team on the winning the Columbus City, City Schools High School Boys Football Championship and applaud them and their school for its continued tradition of academic excellence. And their record was 12 to 2, and um, I move for adoption. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hart. Adopted. Thank you. Coach Miranda, the floor is yours. <clears throat> well, um, thank you. Uh, it's, it's Jim Miranda. That's why the kids all laughed and stuff, but it, it's fine. Hey, uh, uh, Councilman uh, Tyson, I want to thank you and all the city councilmen for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you got a lot of work to do in just in, just in governing this whole, this whole city, um, but to taking the time to recognize uh, their, these achievements of these young men. Um, it's not easy, um, and don't don't get me wrong. Um, championships are won all all around all around the state, um, but you know, for have a city league team to actually uh, accomplish it, you know, with not having the same kind of resources that that some other you know districts have. Be honest, and uh, for them to do it, it doesn't happen often. It took us 10 years to get back here to get back to this opportunity, and so it's been done three times in you know in the history of Columbus. So. Um, it's, a, it's, it's great for that you, uh, you tell, like I said, take the time to acknowledge these young men. They did a tremendous job, and, uh, and we're proud of them. And the city got behind them um, as well, so that, that, was, that was great. And so I want to thank you for taking the time to acknowledge them. I'd like to have our captains just come up and introduce themselves, and, you know, and so everybody knows. And, and the other gentlemen, young men, can also say their names, but the captains can certainly come sure. up and speak. Sounds good. Hello, I'm Savon Edwards. I play running back and corner. Okay. Hi, my name is Micah Coleman. Um, I'm an all-state defensive back. Um, I major, I, I attend a major in uh, general psychology and philosophy, and I plan on attending Denison University on an academic full ride scholarship. My name is Tyree Gray Sawyer. I'm a senior at Eastmore Academy. Um, I have a couple of college options, but I'm undecided uh, as of right now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Travis Clafelter Jr. Um, I have two options for college, uh, Otterbein or Capital University. Um, I'm a senior. <laughs> uh, my name is Marquise Lasser. I was a quarterback at Eastmore Academy. I'm a senior. And right now I have two options for college. Um, I'm Ty Belcher, and I'm a senior linebacker at Eastmore Academy. I have several options for college. <clears throat> My name is Napoleon Harris. I'm a senior at Eastmore Academy. I play wide receiver and DB, and I will be playing uh, college football at Notre Dame College. You should have made this your commitment. You did all go hard. My name is Ravon Wheeler. I'm a senior at Eastmore Academy. Uh, I play wide receiver, DB. Uh, I got several options for college also. My name is uh, Tyrese Peaks. I play uh, corner and slot back, and I plan to attend college um, at Capital University.
My name is Emmanuel Conway. I play defensive end. You know, I'm class of 2020. My name is Tremonte Rayford, class of 2020. My name is Antonio Tatum. Um, I'm a right receiver and corner, and I'm class of 2020. My name, my name is Christopher Mason. I'm a sophomore at Eastmore Academy. I play running back, and yeah. My name is Bronson Jones, I'm defensive end in Tennant Eastmore Academy. My name is Corey English, I'm a junior and I play offensive guard and defensive tackle. My name is Joshua Myers and I'm a class 2021. My name is Andrew Bowman and I play offensive tackle class of 2020. My name is Kellen Fleming. I'm a sophomore at Eastmore Academy. I play DN and tight end, class of 2021. My name is Antonio Jenkins. I play receiver and DB. My name is Isaiah Presley, and I play cornerback freshman. My name is Elijah Jennings, and I play um, I play left guard and um, tackle for uh, Eastmore Academy. Oh, I'm a senior. My name is Cameron Long. I'm a running back and I'm a junior at Eastmore Academy. My name is Diamante Sally. I'm a freshman and I play DB. My name is Cameron Foster. I'm a defensive back and I'm class of 2021. My name is Brandon Lovelace. I play linebacker and D tackle, class of 2021. My name is Sheck and Jai. I am a freshman and I play O line and linebacker. Uh, my name is Diamante Brown. I'm a, a sophomore and I play wide receiver. My name is Shaman Turner and I play um, wide receiver and DB. I'm class of 2020. My name is Demetrius Sally, and I play quarterback and safety, uh, class of 2020. My name is Coach Christopher Earl. I coach the offensive line and defensive line. Uh, how y'all doing? Savon Edwards, assistant coach. I coach the running backs and the safeties. Good evening. My name is Coach Moody. I coached uh, wide receivers, and I was assistant coach, and I also co was the head coach for the JV. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Morton, and I am the principal of Eastmore Academy, and I have the honor and privilege to be able to be the one that oversees our coaches and our students, and I want to thank you all for the time that you all have set aside to be able to acknowledge our young people. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's hard work and dedication. And our young men today, they exemplify the definition of teamwork and brotherhood. I'm so proud of their hard work. They continue to go hard in the classroom. They continue to work very hard on the field. And I look forward to see all the future accomplishments. And again, thank you for your acknowledgement tonight. Um, thank you, Principal Morton. And um, I know, you know, the reason why I made sure that each of you said your names, it's just so important that when you are a champion, that we want to, you, we want to recognize you and give you that opportunity to share that. It's also important for us, and there's an initiative that President Harden has been working on. It certainly is a, um, my brother's keeper. And we recognize that we want to make sure that especially young men of color have the opportunity to be able to, one, to become down to this council chambers because this chamber is your chamber. We also want to make sure that people can see young, and I read that resolution, I like to read resolutions, and because I want to be able to showcase what, what's going on in a Columbus City school and to highlight young men 
um, to this community. So people will see you. They want everyone has different opinions about young people and to be able to showcase these young men that are champions that are working hard academically is very, very important. So I thank the principal, the coaches, and I know I thought I saw um, Coach Johnson was here. He was here earlier. He had to go get the kids. Um, our new our new judge's son also helps coach. And I just really appreciate the work of the coaches as mentors to our young people. And just really want to say thank you on behalf of, especially myself and my colleagues. And I don't know if Council Member President Harden, you want to say any comments? I uh, just want to uh, say thank you, Council Member Tyson, for bringing um, these fine young men down, scholar athletes. Um, you made a couple points that I, I, I wholeheartedly um, back. One, um, there is a narrative out there uh, about our young men. And for us to uh, go right up against that and to debunk that, whatever that narrative is, in person, in real, in real time, um, by you guys, um, is something I'm very proud of and grateful for Council Member Tyson. But secondly, um, more important, how many of you guys been been to council before? So three out of the 40. I, council member says something that I, I really want you to take stock in. This is your chamber. This is your house. And so you, and the reason I think that council member has you speak at the lectern is you need to be comfortable coming down here. Each night that we meet as a council, we talk about uh, spending millions of uh, dollars in the pursuit of making Columbus better. We're trying to make it better for you. Um, but for you, but this is a participatory government, which means that you need to be a part of it. And so that's hopefully this is not the last time that you come to that lectern or sit in one of these seats uh, and advocate for what's good for our community. So thank you, Councilmember Tyson, and congratulations, guys. I have to I have one announcement and the Commission on Black Girls will have a meeting this Thursday the 17th at four o'clock at COSI. And the last comment I want to make is that in today's paper uh, on the top of the fold, it was cancer deaths, cancer death rates highest among the poor. And I, if you read the article, um, it's sobering like so many other articles and uh, how our health care, uh, sometimes people just have a difficult time getting access to care. I wanted to share that um, in this article, it also states about the Life Care Alliance, the Columbus Cancer Clinic. And so um, council has provided funding to the Columbus Cancer Clinic for a number of years, a number of years. And so, and it provides, um, so if you have, Columbus Cancer Clinic reduces your risk for cancer by getting regular checkups, following healthy guidelines. It provides cancer risk assessment, screen, skin screening, clinical breast exams, um, mammographies, ultrasounds, biopsies, you know, pap and pelvic cancer, pelvic uh, examinations, except prostate, et cetera. We fund this organization for you to be able to go there and get those services based upon if you, whether you have dollars to pay for it or not. And so if you need to schedule an appointment to go to the Columbus Cancer Clinic, the number is 614 we also provide funding to Primary One Health, and um, the amount's about $4.3 million is budgeted in the 2019 budget. We haven't passed that, but that's approximately what we've been giving them for quite some time. And again, regardless of your ability to pay, you can go and get services at Primary One Health. And they do, again, um, OBGYN, primary care, dental, et cetera. It's really important that we want to make sure that individuals, regardless of their ability to pay, 
can go and get quality health care services in this community that we are paying for as a city. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Member. Uh, I have one, uh, one resolution, uh, Resolution 0009X-2019. I'd like to invite up to the podium Pastors Brian Williams and Charles Newman, Shannon Moore, Sarah Sabihi, uh, Mr. Uh, Fafana, uh, to come up to the podium. Columbus is com comprised of many religious communities, each with its own set of values and beliefs rooted in morality, justice, and equality. As the next generation of faith leaders emerge, we have the unique opportunity to create a space for ongoing dialogue between faith groups and local government officials. That is why City Council created the One Columbus Interfaith Council. Tonight's resolution is a code of civility. This code can help guide the work and deliberations of the Interfaith Council and serve as a model for how our city should pursue civil discourse. Resolution 0009X-2019 is to recognize the role and importance of civility and respect in public discourse at Columbus City Council and throughout the city. This council recognizes that diversity of opinion should be cultivated and encouraged throughout our city. This council commits to nurturing a city free of bias and prejudice towards any group or any individual. So be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby recognize the role and importance of civility and respect in public dis discourse throughout our city and hereby commits to serve as a model for this civil discourse in partnership with the One Columbus Interfaith Council and the residents of Columbus. Uh, are there any comments by my colleagues? Before moving for adoption, I'd like to invite Pastor Williams and anyone else from the Faith Council to offer a few words. Pastor. Uh, well, good evening, uh, Council, and good evening, President Harden. Uh, it's truly an honor to be down here tonight uh, on behalf of this Council. And uh, I was thinking about when you initially brought us together at the beginning of the summertime and you asked this question, what could potentially be the utility of this group? As we begin to discuss all the various challenges that a growing city like Columbus will face, uh, the conversation shifted toward the need for civil discourse, and so that is kind of how we came about this code of civility that we're here tonight to talk about. And so uh, it's been a privilege and an honor to be a part of this group. We look forward to the future. Uh, we're joined by several people from various faith traditions throughout the city of Columbus, and I can say with 100% certainty that I speak on behalf of all of us that we're excited about the direction of our city and for your leadership. And so with that, I'm going to yield the floor to some of my friends. Uh, a few of us are just going to introduce ourselves. My name is Shannon Moore of Hope City House of Prayer, and I serve as an organizer for the faith community here in Columbus. Hello. My name is Abdullah Fofana. Very unusual kind of last name, but you'll get used to it. Fofana. <laughs> I represent the uh, Muslims of Central Ohio, not any specific organization, but we do have a local uh, mosque here on the north side. And we just wanted to thank all of you, President Harden, for your leadership and for putting this conversation together. I believe it starts with a conversation and the brighter days are ahead. So thank you very much. Charles Newman, Senior Pastor of Antioch Baptist Church. It's an honor to talk to all of you. I've always wanted to say hi. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Sabihi, and I'm a member of the Baha'i Faith an independent world religion whose main teachings are the unity of God, the unity of religions, and the unity of humanity. As a member of the Baha'i Faith, I support the code of civility that was presented. Not only does this code support unity, um, the main teaching of my faith, it also encourages our community and our council to support a sense of inclusiveness and understanding of diverse backgrounds and promotes the exchange of new and different ideas among us all. Thank you. Thank you all, and I think there are a few other members of this of this council, and they meet uh, regularly. They're, they um, advise this council and are open to um, just help be a moral a guide um, as the faith community continues to grow and evolve. This is a small representation of the the um, the emerging faith. Uh, community as uh, as these next generation leaders and so they're not even just next generation leaders they're leaders right now and uh, very grateful for them Councilmember Tyson thank you president Harden and I do appreciate um, you bringing this 
these uh, amazing leaders together to be able to move our community forward. I also do just want to say that I appreciate that each of you also recognize um, some of the, and I'm going to use your word today, uh, Pastor Williams, some of the generals in this community, because we can only become, we only be, get better mm -hmm. um, as we recognize the people that came before us. Yeah. And so um, I just appreciate the generals you identify today and look forward to learning from each and every one of you about kind of moving civility forward, but also recognizing the respect you have for the people that came before you. Thank That's you good. so much. With that, I move for adoption. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Harden. Just my, my last comment, I want to um, again um, pay condolences to the uh, Clark family and the First Church of God's family, certainly Deacon Priscilla Tyson in the passing of Bishop Clark's oldest, eldest daughter, um, D, uh, Dianisha Clark. Um, she was laid to rest last week and truly the community came together and so just continue to uh, keep that faith family lifted in prayer. May the clerk now, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30 day legislation by the city clerk? Is there a second? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stanziano, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. Will the clerk now read the ordinance numbers of 30 day legislation on tonight's agenda for first reading? Finance Committee ordinances 3495, 3508 2018, and ordinances 1 and 34 2019. Public Service and Transportation Committee 3449 2018, Economic Development and Small Business Committee 63 2019, Public Utilities Committee ordinances 3067, 3072, 3182, 3311, 3361, 3389, 3428, 3446, 3453 2018, and ordinances 5, 12, 28, 29, 31, and 33 2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, there are no speakers on the first reading. The following ordinance appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read the ordinance numbers of each of those into the record? Resolutions of Expression 1X7X8X 2019. Finance Committee Ordinances 3439, 3442 2018, and Ordinances 5883, 143, and 144 2019. Recreation and Parks Committee Ordinance 3505. Dash 2018, 57, and 113 dash 2019. Public Safety Committee ordinances 2792 and 3456 dash 2018. Public Service and Transportation Committee resolution 406 X dash 2018. Ordinances 3394 and 3399, 3404, 3435, 3462, 3503, 3504 dash 2018, and ordinances 2, 3, 8, and 98-2019. Economic Development and Small Business Committee Ordinances 26 and 27-2019. Housing Committee Ordinances 3409, 3466, 3506, 2018, and Ordinances 53, 54, 55, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, and 79 2019. Neighborhoods Committee. Ordinance 3380-2018, Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 3220-2018 and 101 and 102-2019. Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinance 3440-2018 and Ordinances 4961 and 110-2019. Appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0304, 305, 306, 307, 308-2018 and Appointments 123 four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven dash twenty nineteen. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have uh, three speakers on the uh, consent agenda. Um, the first speaker to come before council is Mr. Nathaniel Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, welcome back to council. Happy New Year. 
Mr. Wilkins is speaking on resolution 0075. Is that correct? Mr. Lieutenant George Wilkins, citizen of the uh, Linden community on Arlington Avenue. I'm going to talk to you about the ordinance number uh, CA3800752019. And just bear with me for just one minute here. Um, before I begin to talk about this particular property of 1638 of Genesee Avenue, I mind you, there's a story behind this particular home. Unfortunately, I lived in my house for 12 years. And as I come to city council and, and go to work at my job, two part-time jobs, Unfortunately, a couple years ago, the city had tore this down, and it kind of broke my heart. And I would tell you, we want to stop the bleeding of tearing down any more homes in Linden. I'm against this for five reasons. I don't want Habitat to get this lot. is because they have already put up beautiful homes in the area, as I see. This particular home was demolished because it wasn't for, for sale sign on the property. I had uh, three other people went inside this property, 1638, when it was still standing. A beautiful home, I mind you, a beautiful home. Unfortunately, it sat vacant for decades, time after time again. And what I have noticed now with the city is we are losing historical homes in this community that people built over several years ago. Again, the city owned another property of 1415 at Genesee Avenue, a wraparound porch at the time, a beautiful historical home once again that can bring people on their, their front porch. I mind you, Habitat owns a property, and I will tell you today it has sit vacant and it was broken into. 1580 of Bradwood Avenue. Again, I'm against this piece of parcel of 1638 of Genesee Avenue. It's because I don't want to see a cookie cutter home in that empty lot. I want to see the same structure, architect, and design what brought me to Arlington Avenue. What I have noticed now is cookie cutter homes that's been built too quickly with craftsmen's touches of people that built for decades and time after time again. And again, I will emphasize again, I'm against this for Habitat to get this lot. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Director, do we know who we're uh, conveying this property to? Uh, thank you, President Harden. This property is being conveyed to Habitat. Hmm. Okay, to Habitat for Humanity. So. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for uh, the director? Seeing none, the next speaker to come before council is uh, Ms. Rosemary Williams. Ms. Williams is speaking on ordinance 3409-2018. Williams, welcome back to council. Hi. Um, my name is Rosemary Williams, and I'm a member of BREAD organization, and I live at 406 Oakland Park Avenue. We support the ordinance, preserving safe, decent, and affordable housing for low and moderate income families is very important. This reminds me of my daughter, and I'd like to share her story. Life seemed to be perfect. She was an OSU grad. She was employed by Columbus City Schools, married with two kids, owned a house and a rental. She and her husband had jobs and life was good. Then a series of unfortunate events changed everything, not the least of which the housing crisis. 
They lost the rental and their house, and in due time, the marriage crumbled. My daughter found herself a single mom with two kids. The salary that seemed to work so well when there were two wage earners in the family now fell woefully short of their needs. After paying payroll taxes and insurance costs, her take-home pay was $1,000 to $1,200 per month. She picked up a second job. She needed a place to live that was affordable, safe, and decent. This was a challenge since realistically, what could she really afford? That what she could really afford was about $500 a month. Hmm. Now I ask you, where can you find a safe, decent place for that amount? You can't. My daughter was lucky. The timing was fortunate. My husband and I had just inherited a house in the Northland area, and we were able to rent it to our daughter at a reduced rate. In effect, she was able to get a rent subsidy, albeit from her parents, but she was able to make life okay. I think about the thousands of other people who need rent help. What is to happen to them and where do they go? Who helps them and who is their advocate? Now, Bread has pushed very hard to win the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. This is many years ago. The fund was, has led to more affordable housing for low-income families. As we look at strategies that the city could consider, could consider for addressing housing issues, we're concerned. There are not enough solutions in place to affect 54,000 low-income households targeted by the Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio. Bread has two requests of the city. First, we'd like to encourage developers to set aside new housing units for families that make less than $42,000 a year, some percentage. Number two, we'd like the city to consider adding $5 million per year to the housing trust fund. What would it take for the city to grant these requests? What type of information do you need from us? Are you, okay. Are you yielding your balance of time? Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Williams. Um, I can tell you that it's certainly the um, top priority of this council and administration to work together with all of our partners, including um, Bread and others, um, as we um, tackle our affordable uh, housing crisis that we uh, all care about. And this. Ordinance is just a small uh, piece of that that pie, uh, so I look forward to working with Brad uh, on the specific items that you talked about to to learn more and kind of talk about things that we can and can't do or things that we are doing. Um, but certainly, uh, thank you for your support for this ordinance. Uh, the next person to come before council is Mr. Mark Fluharty. Mr. Fluharty, welcome back to council. Mr. Florida is speaking also on ordinance 3409, and that's in the housing committee. Thank you, President Hardin, members of council. I too stand in support of this ordinance. As my friend Rosemary has talked about, uh, we all know there's a housing crisis in our community. Uh, we're well aware that you can no longer afford a two bedroom apartment uh, on minimum wage. And as labor and the city work together to, to raise the minimum wage, uh, we have to look for other solutions. And I stand in support of the $5 million request on top of the 1.8 that uh, Brad is asking for. You may ask yourself, uh, Mr. Fluharty, why are you here? You represent labor. Well, unfortunately, sure. this problem just doesn't affect uh, <laughs> people outside labor. It affects those that work every day. A lot of our members are single parents that can't afford housing and can't uh, afford to live and support in the community that they live in. And I think it is very important that everyone have a safe place to live uh, where they can raise their family, especially in a great community like Columbus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fluharty. Uh, Director, do you have any comments? I, know I, didn't, I spoke for you the last time. So, Chief. Uh, thank you, President Hardin, and always feel free to speak for me. Um, the, um, I would like to point out to both the speakers that um, the mayor did announce uh, today, along with President Hardin and the auditor, um, a uh, innovative new bond package that we're hoping to take to the voters this spring that would include 
authorization for the city to issue $50 million worth of bonds targeted toward affordable housing. Uh, we don't know what the program is for that money. Uh, part of our work in the Department of Development in cooperation with organizations like MORPSI will be to come up with a plan um, over the next several months to be able to leverage the those dollars to build on the research that was done by the Affordable Housing Alliance that the city did through our incentive study that builds on the work that the um, BIA released earlier this or late last month um, regarding the shortages and the lack of production of new housing that we're having and, and what are the kind of root causes of our increases in housing. So I did want to uh, point up to the uh, listening and viewing audience as well as the speakers that we are taking action on this. I think the mayor, um, along with the support of council, is taking very bold action on this. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Director. Are there any other comments or questions on the consent action part, portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may I get a motion for uh, passage of the consent? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Skinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Consent portion, our consent agenda passes. Uh, we will now move forward with, uh, uh, proceed with second reading or 30 day tabled or emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Finance Committee. Councilmember Elizabeth Brown chairs that committee. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Hardin. Tonight in finance, we have Ordinance 0135-2019 to appropriate and authorize the City Auditor to transfer $9,115,625.46 from the Special Income Tax Fund to the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority Fund for the purpose of providing secondary funding in the event that Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority cannot meet its debt obligations to appropriate and expend up to $7,038,312.50 within the Special Income Tax Fund Fund for reimbursement to the River South Authority to make lease payments to appropriate and expend up to $1,848,250 to the River South Authority to make lease payments and to declare an emergency. The payments authorized by this ordin ordinance are in accordance with the lease agreements the City of Columbus is currently entered into with the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority and the River South Authority. It is important to note that the $9.1 million transfer of funds to the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority will only occur in the event that they are unable to meet their debt obligations as outlined in the lease. No payments have been needed since 1990, and it is not anticipated that they will be needed this year. The $7 million payment to the River South Authority covers bond service charges for the redevelopment and rehabilitation of the former downtown Lazarus department store. The city entered into a series of agreements with the River South Authority between 2004 and 2014, which make these payments necessary. The final appropriation of $1.8 million covers bond service charge payments for the construction of the underground parking garage and park located at COSI. The city entered into a master lease agreement and supplemental lease agreement for this project in 2016. Through these partnerships and investments and redevelopment projects, the city is helping to positively impact the local economy through the revitalization of neighborhoods and the creation of jobs. Emergency action is being considered so that the payments are not delayed. Questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Remy, Spinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. And as second chair of economic development, I have one ordinance to read. May I do that Please. now? Please. Ordinance 3381-2018 to create the Kenny and Henderson Community Reinvestment Area and to authorize real property tax exemptions as established in section 3735.65 to 3735.70 of the Ohio Revised Code. I would like to request to table pending a public hearing. Please call the roll. That was ordinance number 3469. 3469. Oh, I'm sorry. I have the wrong number on here. No, I apologize. 3469-2018, uh, not 3381 mm -hmm. 2018. Is there a second on 3469? Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Tabled. Yep. Thank you so much. That's all I have, President Hardin. Thank you, Chair Brown. The next committee to come before council is the Public Service Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Remy. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. 
tonight in public service. I have ordinance number 3412-2018 to authorize the city attorney to file complaints in order to immediately appropriate and accept the fee simple and lesser real estate necessary to timely complete the arterial street rehabilitation Hamilton Road between Morse Road and Maneri Lane public improvement project and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have ordinance number 0006, 2019, to appropriate $6,450,000 from the unappropriated balance of the Municipal Motor Vehicle License Tax Fund for anticipated 2019 operating expenditures for the Department of Public Service, Divisions of Infrastructure Management and Traffic Management, and to declare an emergency. Seeing no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, we have ordinance number 0007, 2019, to authorize the appropriation of funds within the county auto license tax fund to authorize the director of public service to expend said monies or so much thereof as may be needed for Franklin County engineer approved roadway construction and maintenance projects undertaken by the Division of Traffic Management and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 0010, 2019, to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the transfer of funds between projects within the Streets and Highways Bond Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into a contract modification with Kokosing Construction Company for the resurfacing 2018 Project 3 contract to authorize the expenditure of up to $1,161,167.86 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund in relation to this contract modification and to declare an emergency. The legislation authorizes the Director of Public Service to modify and increase the, an existing contract with Kokosing Construction Company for resurfacing 2018 Project 3 in the amount of up to $1,119,546.76. Ordinance 1913 2018 authorizes the Director of Public Service to enter into a contract with Kokosing Construction for the construction of resurfacing 2018 Project 3 and to provide for construction administration inspection services. This, the contract repairs and resurfaces 88 city streets and constructs 512 ADA curb ramps along those streets. This modification will add resurfacing and pavement repairs on State Route 161 from the city corporation limits to the pavement change at Little Turtle Way to, con to the contract. <coughs> if there are no questions or comments from my colleagues. I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, I have ordinance 0011, 2019, to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into a contract modification with Johnson, Mirmurin, and Thompson in connection with the UIRF South Linden Sidewalks 2017 project to authorize the expenditure of up to $21,319.87 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund for the UIRF South Linden Sidewalks 2017 project and to declare an emergency. Seeing no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Finally, I have ordinance number 0036, 2019, to authorize the Chief Innovation Officer to modify a professional services contract with GPD Group relative to the Smart City Challenge, Vulcan Charging, and Decarbonization Project, contingent upon the execution of the revised amendment obligated by Paul G. Allen Philanthropies to authorize the expenditure of up to $351,000 from the Smart City Private Grant Fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you very much. That's all I have tonight in public service and transportation. Thank you, Chair Remy. The next committee to come before council is the Housing Committee. That committee this evening is chaired by Councilmember Tyson. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. I have ordinance number 0043-2019 to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the director of the Department of Development to make financial assistance available as, 
has grants to homeowners, home buyers, renters, for-profit and nonprofit organizations to increase the local supply of decent, safe, and sanitary housing and decrease the number of vacant properties in our neighborhoods. To authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer cash and appropriation between projects within the Housing Preservation Fund. To authorize the expenditure of $1,175,790.88 from the 2018 Housing Preservation Fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance is also co-sponsored co by Council Member Stenziano. There are no questions or comments. I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0044-2019 to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the director of the Department of Development to make financial assistance available as grant as grants to homeowners, home buyers, renters, for-profit and nonprofit organizations to increase the local supply of decent, safe, and sanitary housing and dec decrease the number of vacant properties in our neighborhoods, to authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer cash and appropriation between projects within the Development Taxable Bond Fund, and to authorize the expenditure of $2 million from the 2018 Development Taxable Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. So just those two ordinances are over almost four million dollars for um, for housing in our community. The next, I move for uh, this also. So this ordinance is also co-sponsored by Council Member uh, Michael Cinziano, and now um, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Cinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0066-2018 to authorize the director of the Department of Development to renew contracts with various contractors that provide emergency home repair services to low and moderate income households in Columbus to waive the competitive bidding provision of the Columbus City Code to authorize expenditure of $500,000 from the Housing Preservation Fund and to declare an emergency. The companies that will be if we pass the legislation where that would be receiving these dollars responded to a request for qualifications um, and, all, and all of those responded were selected, although one contractor later withdrew. Emergency repair services will include heating, plumbing, electrical, and other emergency home repairs needed to protect the health and safety of the citizens of Columbus. The contracts will go to the American Mechanical, the Ohio Mechanical, Watt One, and TFH-EB doing business as the Waterworks. If there, I also want to, um, this is co-sponsored also by Councilor Michael Stenziano. Any comments, hmm. Director? Uh, thank you, um, Council Member Tyson, President Hardin, members of Council. Uh, just a quick note, we are asking to waive competitive bidding on this because we did do a process, however, we selected multiple contractors that allows us to move through our request more rapidly rather than having one contract for a certain amount and then another contract for a certain amount. So it allows us to cycle through contractors and cycle through projects much more quickly. Thank you. Thank you. There are no questions or comments. I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. I'd now like to move to Health and Human Services. Please. Thank you. I have ordinance number 0059-2019 to make the appropriation for the 12 months ending December the 31st of 2019 for the Health Department's Grants Fund to the Department of Health in various projects and object classes for the continued operations of grant programs and to authorize the Board of Health to accept a grant award and to declare an emergency. This is an annual appropriation ordinance for Columbus Public Health grants that allows for continued operations of the various grant programs at the health department and to accept a new continuation grant for um, fiscal year 2019 for the Franklin County TB Clinic. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. That's all I have in those committees this evening. Thank you, Chair Tyson. Um, We were so close uh, to hearing all of our uh, agenda items, but we will go to, um, let's kind of get a motion to adjourn for zoning. Recess, I apologize.
Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Cinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Council's recess. We will uh, move to zoning momentarily. Regular meeting number two will now come to order. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. We will now go to the zoning committee. Councilmember Tyson chairs that committee. Council, uh, all <laughs> members serve on the committee. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you. I have, um, before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking before the council on zonings and variances. We will permit three speakers on each side, three proponents, three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side, and we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. On the advice of the city attorney's office, we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against any resolution, any, any resolution, any council variance, including staff, please stand and raise your right hand and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you. The first ordinance is 0038-2019 to grant a variance in the provisions of sections 3332.035R3 residential district 3312.49 minimum number of parking spaces required 3321.05B2 vision clearance 3332.05 area district lot with lot with requirements 3332.13R3 area district requirements 3332.18D basis of computing area 33 32.21 building lines 33 32.25 maximum site yards required 33 32.26 minimum site yards required and 33 32.27 rear yard of the columbus city codes for the property located at 1685 oaks Street to permit a mixed use development with reduced development standards in the R3 residential district. The applicant is Jean Cabral. The proposed use is a mixed use building. The city department's recommendation is approval. The Near East Air Commission's recommendation is approval 14 to 0. I first move to waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. And now I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. Ordinance number 0041-2019 to rezone 5850 Sunbury Road being 6.3 acres located in the east side of Sunbury Road, 1,000 feet south of State Route 161 from R Rural District to, L to LAR ARLD Limited Apartment Residential District. The applicant is Metro District LLC care of Jill Tangman. The proposed use is a multi-unit residential development. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Norfolk Community Council's recommendation is 13 to three. Um, I first move to waive second reading. Second. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. And now I move to table this to this um, legislation until January 28th per the applicant. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. The next ordinance um, is a variance that complements the last uh, piece of legislation. It's 0042-2019 to grant a variance for the provisions of sections 3333.255, perimeter yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 5850 Sunbury Road to permit an apartment complex with reduced perimeter yard in the LA. ARLD Limited Apartment Residential District. Again, the applicant is Metro Development LLC, care of Jill Tangman. Proposed use is a multi unit residential development. The State Department's recommendation is approval. The Norfolk Community Council's recommendation is approval 13 to 3. I first move to waive second reading. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. I move to table this legislation until January 28th per the applicant. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0047 2019 to rezone 4464 Professional Parkway, being 10.53 acres located on the north side of Professional Parkway, 860 feet 
east of Hamilton Square Boulevard from our rural district to PUD 6 plan unit development district. The applicant is M5LP, care of Joe Tangman. Proposed use is a multi-unit residential development. The city department's recommendation is a disapproval. The greater southeast area commission's recommendation is approval. I first move to waive second reading. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. And I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. And then um, the, the final ordinance in, um, in this committee is 3305 2008 to resume 5330 Warner Road, being 6.42 acres located at the northeast corner of Warner Road and North Hamilton Road from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Sarah Radcliffe. The proposed use is commercial development. The C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Rocky Fork Black Lick Accord Implementation Panel's recommendation is approval 6 to 0. So I would move to waive second reading. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. That waived. Thank you, and I will now move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. That concludes the zoning agenda for today. Thank you, Chair Tyson. Uh, seeing no further business before the zoning committee, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Please, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. The zoning is adjourned. Uh, we will. Can I get a motion to reconvene special meeting number or not special meeting meeting number one? Please call the roll. Brown Brown Remy Stinziano Tyson President Harding. Uh, we are back in session. Uh, the next committee to come before council is the Rules and Reference Committee. Uh, we have one ordinance in this committee. It is or Ordinance 3386-2018. Uh, President Pro Tem Cinziano um, will chair the Rules and Reference Committee. Thank you, President Hardin. Tonight, bring forward Ordinance 3386-2018 to enact Columbus City Code Sections 107.02, 107.03, 107.04, .03, 107.04, and 170.05 regarding contribution limits for municipal candidates, campaign finance disclosure, disclosure for election period communications, new duties for the city clerk and city attorney, and fines and penalties for violation of the new code and to repeal existing Columbus City Code Section 2321.53. Uh, as you may remember, at our uh, meeting on December 10th, 2018, we tabled, uh, and so to bring it back forward, I'd first like to remove the ordinance from the table. Second. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Ordinance removed from the table. Uh, thank you, President Hardin. I'll talk a little about it. So last year, uh, the mayor's administration, along uh, with some uh, council members and council staff, uh, started researching further potential recommendations regarding the regulation of dark money, as well as the city's potential first limits on the amounts and resources of campaign contributions. I think uh, everyone around this dais, uh, members of the public, this has been an issue that we've been discussing for a while. Uh, but with the Supreme Court decision and Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington versus Federal Elections Commission and Crossroads Grassroots Policy Strategies, uh, it really opened the door uh, regarding potential greater disclosure, disclosure uh, from groups paying for election period communications, including uh, dark money. Uh, so with that staff review from the administration and uh, LRO uh, really evaluated what other cities did, uh, showed us uh, that there is a wide range of campaign finance regulations, uh, including limits established at the local and state level, limits applied per election or per calendar year, a uh, combination of these options and variations in allowable contribution sources uh, with real no clear trend. And I know we've all discussed uh, those trends and where that could lead us. Uh, what was clear uh, in our discussions and what we've heard from the public uh, is a lot of support regarding any effort to bring forward uh, into the sunshine, into the sunlight uh, where there is dark money uh, and a lot of discussion on if there are campaign finance limits, uh, what that could be. Uh, everyone uh, in the city and uh, in, in central Ohio seems very concerned about the role dark money can play, uh, both that we've seen at the local level uh, and potentially uh, in municipal or campaign issues uh, around our community. 
As you know, the two most common vehicles for dark money in politics are politically active nonprofits uh, and corporate entities such as super PACs or limited liability companies. Uh, and in the 2018 election cycle, our research showed more than $1 billion in dark money was spent to influence elections in America. Uh, that Citizens United case that kind of got this uh, unfortunately going uh, has been one that I think we're troubled by and really applaud both the administration and, and the leadership on council uh, for looking to see what would be possible. And so that that brings us to this proposed legislation uh, today. Uh, the city, in looking at the Ohio revised, revised code contribution limits, uh, which have not been found unconstitutional, uh, unconstitutional, as well as opportunities to increase disclosure of dark money, uh, has brought forward this ordinance with proposed changes that do the following, but it isn't limited, uh, to limiting annual contribution to municipal candidates by following state law contribution amounts, create new, somewhat first of its kind, uh, dark money disclosures uh, requiring that anyone issuing an election period communication to immediately disclose their contributions, expenditures and debts, continue to require more campaign finance disclosures than what's required at the state law, and the, from what our research showed, most disclosure of any large city in Ohio, require auditing of all campaign finance filings to assure compliance with campaign finance laws, create a system to report and investigate alleged violations of the new city code, and allow a non-refundable municipal tax credit of $50 per individual or $100 per joint filer if they file a city tax return, mirroring similar state law uh, for candidates. Again, want to thank uh, the mayor's administration, particularly Brian Clark, uh, for his work, engagement, and answering a lot of questions, as well as Council President Harden, uh, your staff, and LRO for answering additional uh, questions for me and my colleagues. Uh, as mentioned, the ordinance was previously on our agenda, but based on the feedback from colleagues, we did table so that we could have additional discussions and considerations. I do want to thank all of you for your flexibility with my schedule uh, when I called the last hearing. I know there was a lot of conflicts, uh, but thought it was important uh, to have it and, and be able to be as transparent as possible. So on the December 10th meeting, we announced we were going to have that hearing. I know some conflicts came up, like having to go to Washington, D.C. to see a senator sworn in, uh, and other conflicts. And uh, know, though, that we've been engaged. Uh, I've appreciated your uh, pressing questions and the discussion we've had within the body and with the public. And, and do want to thank the public uh, for your ongoing discussion, emails, and considerations. We've heard a lot uh, of feedback and uh, really appreciate where we're at at this point. I think part of our charge, we know this isn't the end of this discussion, but this gets us going, so we have something in place for this year's municipal election. It's a starting point uh, and one that long overdue, considering we've had nothing uh, in terms of limits and some of these actions within the city of Columbus. So we are strengthening the integrity of our elections. Uh, maybe not where everyone thinks it should go, uh, but certainly one that is a balancing and uh, taking into account uh, members' comfort levels as well as the public's. So again, want to thank you all for your ongoing input and work in this process. Uh, in our conversation since the last meeting, there was uh, an amendment uh, I want to give you the highlight of that before we get to some public speakers. Uh, so we will be looking to amend, as submitted to the clerk, Amendment 3386-2018. Uh, this amendment would change Section 107.02, Section D6, which uh, did not exist in the proposal but reflects a little bit of what we have in current uh, law. Any candidate or candidate committee that would raise over $1,000 would be required to disclose and file. Uh, currently, it's at 10000 It was not in the proposal that was presented on December 10th. Uh, this mirrors state law at that 1000 level. Are there any questions or comments on the proposed amendment? Seeing none, I would like to move to amend as submitted to the clerk's office. The amendment. You want to move with the amendment? Before I would love to do the amendment, and that way the speakers are Perfect. working off and we have the a next second. vehicle. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stinziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. So yes, Council President, it's off the table. It's been uh, the amendments been added, and as I mentioned, we have four speakers. The first speaker tonight is Joe Motil, uh, followed by Nicole Butler. Joe Motil. Don't see Joe. I will move on to Nicole Butler. Followed by Abraham Bonowitz. We'll have you come after the other speakers, Joe. You'll get your chance. <laughs> it's all right. Good 
Good evening. Good evening. Um, I really have appreciated the time that you've taken to engage with us on this issue. I know that you were intending to vote for this proposal last month and that you pushed the hearing back to allow for public feedback. I, I also appreciate the time that you've taken to review testimony and I'm especially grateful to Councilman Cinziano for the effort he's taken to engage in a dialogue with us and with me individually. Um, I do want to talk a bit about that public feedback. There were two public hearings. Three people also spoke at the City Council meeting in December. Um, in all, more than 30 people have spoken out against the proposed contribution limit. It was not just Yes We Can that spoke up against this measure. There were lawyers, social workers, a former state legislator, numerous area commissioners, medical students, common cause, dozens of community members have spent time away from their families and personal lives so they could be here to let you know that they opposed this contribution limit. Uh, we have a petition with 172 signatures on it asking you to reconsider. Other than the mayor and the people who are voting tonight, I've only heard three people say that they think this limit is a good idea. Three in a city of nine, almost 900,000 people. As Councilperson Tyson said at the last council session, yes, you do make time to allow the public to speak, and I appreciate that. But this experience has shown me that it doesn't matter what we say. The public reaction to this proposal has not been ambiguous. Every person who has spoken out against this proposal has said the limit is too high. Every person has said they want to see the dark money disclosure element passed before the next election, and every person has asked you to lower the limit. You've told us you have until March to make this change. That's at least another five council meetings, I think, uh, at which you could vote. You've had the two public hearings, but Councilman Cinziano is the only person who has attended them. Uh, I'm not faulting you for having personal lives, and I understand that you're working on a lot of different projects simultaneously. My point is only that the purpose of a public hearing is so you can hear the public. Most of you voting tonight have not had a chance to do that. I don't know if you've watched uh, the hour and a half of testimony from the first hearing or the two hours of testimony from the second. I know that Councilwoman Brown has. Thank you. Uh, and, and, uh, I, and I do appreciate you going to that trouble. But the testimony is for you. Those people are talking to you. <laughs> Those people are your constituents. Um, I want to encourage you, all of you, to hold another hearing and actually listen to what the public has to say. Um, I want to say I also don't believe that you have all the information that you need to vote today. The reason uh, you shared with me for excluding political parties from the limit is that Seattle and Austin do so. And I, I let you know, Councilman Stinziano, on Friday, that they don't. Are you really comfortable voting tonight without knowing why all the pieces of this proposal were included or what effect they might have? Um, uh, the answer to the question that has been asked repeatedly of those who have testified against this contribution limit, would you like us to reject a $13,000 limit, even if that means we won't have a limit in place this year, is yes, 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 yes. Setting a $13,000 limit is saying it's okay to give $13,000. I think what you're choosing to do is going to encourage donors to give even more than they already do. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, Abraham Bonowitz, followed by Catherine Terser. Good evening. Um, I want to thank you all for your leadership. And um, I had no idea about this until last night. A friend of mine sent me a note and said, hey, have you seen this is happening? What do you think? Um, I do a lot of campaign work. I do a lot of fundraising. Being able to get to a million dollars with fewer than 77 donors when you're representing 900,000 people or whatever subdivision of that is, invites problems, invites a candidate coming in and winning a seat when they're not really planning to be representative of the people. $13,000 would make, would be you know, way out of proportion to what most municipal campaign 
limits, contribution limits are anywhere in the country. And it didn't take very long to figure that out. I mean, one quick Google search. It's, it's just a, a very large number. And I think for people who want to be representative of their constituents, you gotta go knocking on every door. And I'm sure every one of you does. But you really need to make it more competitive. And when you have limits like that, where you can get 76 friends, 77 friends, or friends of friends, or friends of the people who are trying to move legislation to get you just to a million dollars, that's, it's too much of a gimme. So I encourage you to rethink this. I don't know the organization. Yes, we can, I don't know anything about them. Um, I did go and look them up and sign up today because I'm interested in seeing what they're doing and, and I'm glad for their leadership, but I have no, yeah, somebody, somebody from, a friend of mine from California said, hey, did you see this? So I'm here to say it's too high. Thank you. Mr. Bonovitz, could you clarify, or do you support the rest of the legislation? I, uh, um, I like the idea about the dark, tra the, the dark money limitations and everything that you were saying. Again, this is brand new. I'm here about the, the, the limits on contributions. Um, so what I heard sounded good. Okay, thank you. Any other and questions? And I would encourage you to go ahead and vote that if you can. Any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Terser. And if everyone will grant me, since I only have three more meetings after this one, we'll have Mr. Motil uh, go after Catherine. Hello, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you this evening. Uh, my name is Catherine Terser. I work for Common Cause, um, and we're really focused on transparency and accountability and really engaging people in as much as possible in government and voting. Um, and I wanted to say that this proposal uh, is wonderful in many ways. Uh, first of all, when we think about um, what's gone on with dark money and some of the problems that we've had since Citizens United versus FEC, which is in 2010, we know that dark money's played an outside role. And in fact, this proposal, 3386, 2018, um, it, it in fact leads the way we do know like the state legislature hasn't addressed dark money. We know now it looks like the US House is starting to address uh, dark money in House Resolution 1, but in fact, you're leading the way with this resolution. And you should feel really good about that. Um, I also really support the $50 tax credit, which encourages small donors. You know, one of the things that we all know is that money isn't actually speech. It just feels that way, and it functions that way. And something that invites small donors into the process, they're just much more likely to participate, and I think that's a really good aspect of this proposal. Now, I've identified some of the merits of this proposal, but if, you know, it includes things like, I really appreciate the auditing, I appreciate the consequences for violations, but like others, I'm also concerned about the contribution limitations. Now, the reason we have contribution limits, you know, really is because you want to root out quid pro quo. Now, obviously, rooting out corruption is important, um, but it also is about the appearance of impropriety. It's about giving a sense that, you know, it's not so much money that it just is overwhelming. And if you, if you look at the state level, which is a very high contribution limit, and you use that as, hey, that's, that's, that's a real limit, it, it just isn't. It's like giving 100, uh, 100 miles per hour is a speed limit. It's just, it's not really a speed limit. When we get on 315, we're not gonna go 100 miles an hour. It's as if it's not a true limitation. The thing to also remember is the state has the contribution limit by cycle. That means it's $12,000 plus change, every cycle. So in a four year, four year terms, you basically would have three contribution limits of $2,000. Well, this is four contribution limits of $12,000, which is truly significant. I think it's also important to remember that high contribution limits can, in fact, mean that the campaign's money goes directly to candidates, but 
you have to also remember that even at the state where we have these incredibly high contribution limits, there's still dark money. There still are independent expenditures working their way around. So having a limit that makes people feel really comfortable and have faith that people not be unduly being influenced is truly important. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Thank you, Thank Mr. You Chair, sir. And Joe Matil will be our last speaker. President Hardin, uh, Pro Tem Stenziano, members of City Council, Joe Motil, 167 West Cook Road, Columbus, Ohio. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak this evening. Uh, once again, I feel this council has failed to recognize the voices of its citizens when it comes to their feelings and concerns about city policy. Whether it's stopping the continuation of granting tax abatements in the short north, downtown, Polaris, East, and Rickenbacker, and other prosperous areas of Columbus, or allowing your fat cat developer campaign contributors to build high density residential units in the neighborhoods where they are not desired by the people who live in those neighborhoods. And then there's the criminal act of what is supposed to be the most sacred form of democracy. City council and county dishonored the outcome of our vote when the people clearly said no to the public financing of the nationwide arena. And then city council stole millions of taxpayer dollars from casino revenue that was meant to help with our children's educational needs, and you basically gave it to a professional sports franchise. And you passed ordinances to further increase the taxation of citizens for various entertainment and sporting events without allowing the people to vote on it. The recent public hearings on campaign finance reform and other city council public hearings are nothing more than dog and pony shows while giving false impression that the voice of the people is being taken into account. Your minds were made up and the ink was dry on any legislation well before any public hearing because of the harmonious relationship between you, the mayor's office, the Columbus Partnership, and the current and past leadership of the Franklin County Democratic Party. The only way we will ever achieve historic status from tonight's proposed legislation is by giving back the, the public back, the use of taxpayer paid public television for campaign purposes and other uses and not using it solely for city hall propaganda. Place limitations on contributions from both Franklin County Republican and Democratic parties because they will be used as a conduit by your wealthy contributors and as history has already proven, certain types of contractors doing business with the city will also funnel excessive contributions through political parties. Limitations should also be set for citizen-driven ballot initiatives. Limits need to be placed on in-kind contributions which have historically been used by the council president and other council members to buy influence from one another and to beef up newly appointed council members' war chests to get them elected. This assures the team concept that you have historically used during your election campaigns so that you remain a cohesive group of seven while rubber stamping legislation and approving unwarranted tax abatements for your campaign contributors. Allowing $50,000 worth of campaign contributions over a four-year term and excluding the restrictions I have mentioned will merely continue the influence peddling at City Hall and diminish a citizen's seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mertil. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Okay, thank you. Thanks. So again, uh, as I think you've heard and we've heard during the testimony, uh, a lot of support uh, for the ordinance, but the campaign limit uh, was something that I know we really struggled with. Uh, some members thought, no problem, what are we trying to solve? Others felt could be lower, uh, but appreciate everyone's willingness to have the conversation, uh, willing to uh, listen and work with our public. Uh, and while, again, no legislation is perfect, this is a big first step. President Hardin, don't know if you have any comments on the legislation? Well, thank you, uh, President Pro Tem Cinziano, for your leadership on this issue. I think it is um, extremely important when you have a issue that um, can be seen as contentious um, by some um, I think the process matters all the time, but I think the process matters even more in those instances. And um, for those who would say that there was a path to passage of this and that we were, we were just gonna stick to it, I will say it was phone calls and conversations that each and one of these members of council had that extended and, and created room for another 
public dialogue. Um, this is good legislation. For the first time, we are putting a cap on campaign finance limits in our city. That should not be um, discounted. Uh, there is now, there will be, if, if this is so passed, a, a limit for the first time in the city of Columbus. Um, how we govern ourselves is an ongoing dialogue. It's a conversation back and forth between members of the community. It's a conversation that was had um, several times over the last couple of years, when most recently um, on the size and makeup of this council. The public spoke uh, and there were changes made. Every 10 years, this uh, a body is brought together to look at how the city governs itself as a charter review committee. I think that this piece of legislation is a good first historic step in, the, in that direction. Um, I know for sure, as, in, as stated in the code, that um, campaign finance and, and other things will be discussed at the next charter review committee. I think this gives us an opportunity to, uh, to have uh, a, a meaningful first step, but also to continue the dialogue of governing. Um, and I do appreciate each and every one of the comments, um, and I know that each member of council heard from many people. Uh, and but I am supporting this uh, this piece of legislation uh, because uh, I th I think that it uh, for the first time caps what folks are able to do. It forces folks to disclose dark money in our community. It encourages small level donations, and um, and so I think it's good. The one not question that I had, but I didn't know if Director DeLong wanted to speak to it. There is the one piece of this legislation that will um, cost or have an allocation of resources that will have to be associated with it is the new auditor that will have to be hired. One of the things that we ask about in, in talking about this legislation is um, some independence of that, that auditor, uh, where that person would be placed and what uh, independence they would have from, say, uh, um, one a council member or so not liking what they were saying and um, having the freedom to uh, to terminate that person. And so I think we did some very specific things in there. And Director DeLong, could you speak to that position specifically and kind of, and, and where and how where we, we ended up? Absolutely, President Harden, Chair Stanciano. Um, in, in this position, it's going to be called the Campaign Finance Administrator. In researching this type of position anywhere in the country, all of these positions are unclassified, except in Columbus, Ohio, where this position will be classified. That means it's not at the discretion of the appointing authority in terms of hiring or firing that person. They will have rights under their um, union or under the MCP contract to keep their position. So if there's any discretion or somebody trying to get rid of them for reasons that are outside of the inability to perform their job. Um, so in that sense, um, the good part about this position is with the passage of this tonight, if so, um, we will move forward with having this position posted tomorrow. Um, this position, like I said, is gonna be called the Campaign Finance Administrator. I wanna give a little um, shout out in terms of the qualifications that this person is going to require because we definitely are in need of a excellent person for this position. Um, this person is going to possess a bachelor's degree. They prefer candidate will have significant experience in accounting, financial administration, financial auditing, investigatory auditing, or ethics compliance. And we also are asking for this person preferably to have a law degree. Um, I know our city clerk um, is excited about getting this position hired quickly and has um, addressed the importance of this position being able to hit the ground running um, because we want to be able to hire someone who has these qualifications and can start this immediately. Um, so we hope to have this position only posted for a very short period of time. We're looking at right now, I think, um, five to seven days, but we will op continue to open it if we don't get candidates. But like I said, we really are hoping to get this person so when this um, legislation 
and I think it's, it's the date soon that this will actually take effect that this person is here and ready to um, perform its duties. Thank you, Director. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, President Hardin. Council Member Marimi. I would like to publicly thank Council President Pro Tem for holding the hearing. I know that I appreciated the time you've taken to brief me and my team about this, this important legislation. Uh, I also enjoyed the opportunity to watch the public testimony. Um, um, certainly with modern technology, we're able to do that um, from afar and certainly understand exactly the sentiment of the testimony that was given. But specifically, I'd like to thank um, Director DeLong. I know that um, this was a concern as Council President uh, Harden mentioned, and we certainly appreciate um, the ability to carve this out and make this a classified position. This is only the beginning of the conversation, I, I feel, and certainly um, a historic day in the city of Columbus for us to um, provide um, an inordinate amount of transparency um, within the state, and you know, within the state, maybe the most transparent, and certainly um, welcome that transparency. And so, I look forward to the continued dialogue and discussion that we have. And so, appreciate all of your work, Co Council President Pro Tem. It certainly is uh, very much um, appreciated. Thanks, Councilmember Mitch Brown. Uh, I want to echo that. Uh, Michael, you've done a yeoman's job uh, keeping me informed constantly. Uh, we spend too much time on the phone sometimes, uh, as you know. But uh, the, uh, the hard work you put into making this happen is certainly appreciated, and thank you. Well, it's easy, Council Member Brown, when the Steelers aren't in the playoffs to, <laughs> to get you. Too soon? <coughs> Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, having removed the ordinance from the table, uh, having amended, I will then move for passage as amended. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you, Chair Stenziano. Seeing no further, uh, no further business coming for council, may I get a motion to adjourn meeting number one? So moved. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Remy, Stenziano, Tyson, President Hardin. Meeting is adjourned. No meeting. So next week is MLK Day. There is no meeting of council. Also, I uh, failed to mention that uh, with our new council member, uh, Council Member Shayla Favors, uh, a formal swearing-in ceremony will be announced at a later date. So thank you. And we have two.